after reading this passage, I am reminded of a story of Puccini, the great Italian writer of such classic operas as Madame Butterfly and La Bohème. It seems when Puccini was fairly young, he contracted cancer. And so he decided to spend his last days writing his final opera, Toronto. While writing it, friends and disciples would say to him, you are ailing, take it easy and rest. He would always respond, I'm going to do as much as I can so I can on my so, I, so as, as much as I can on my great masterpiece. And, is, and it is up to you, my friends, to finish it if I don't. Well, Puccini died before the opera was completed. Now his friends had a choice. They could forever mourn their friend and return to life as usual, or they could build on his melody and complete what he started. They chose the latter. And so, in 1926, at the famous La Scala Opera House in Milan, Italy, Buccini's opera was played for the first time, conducted by the famous conductor Arturo Coscolini. The Gospel of John is widely held to be written by John. While there is disagreement concerning the identification of John, the author claims to be an eyewitness to the life of Jesus. We read in John chapter 19, he who saw this has testified that you also, so that you also may believe. None of the other gospels tells of this incident where, where some Greeks, where some Greeks wanted to see Jesus, and Jesus speaks about his death. While John plainly says that he did not intend to tell everyone about every, everything about Jesus, he brings into sharp focus the person of Christ and the meaning of the gospel. The arrival of the Greeks marks the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. The Greeks, the Hellenes, are to be distinguished from Greek-speaking Jews, the Hellenistae. The Greek diaspora was fairly broad at this point in history. The Greeks had a well-established reputation for traveling throughout the, the known world by the time of our gospel story. However, The Greeks were not just curious travelers. They were often seekers of the truth. Therefore, it was not unusual to find a Greek who was versed in philosophy or religion. Our gospel lesson or story tells us today, tells today that these particular Greeks came to worship at the festival, which meant that they were probably proselytes representatives of the Gentile world. Their request to see Jesus confirms the Pharisees' unconscious prophecy in the verse of John that precedes our gospel story. You see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone to him. Nevertheless, it was a considerable distance from Athens to Jerusalem approximately 800 miles. While more than likely, our Greeks traveled by boat across the Mediterranean Sea, which could be turbulent at times. Paul describes his sail, for example, as we sail slowly for a number of days and arrive with difficulty off Sidus, Nidus. And as the wind was against us, we sailed under the lee of Crete of Salmone. If one walked or traveled by animal from Athens to Greek, one would have to travel through Macedonia, Thrace, Mycia, Asia, Pamphylia, Cilicia, Syria, 
and possibly Phoenicia to get to Judea, where Jerusalem is. Such a trip would take a long time. We must ask ourselves, what kind of faith brought the Greeks to seek Jesus when they appeared before to Philip? Was it, was it the kind of faith that is pretentious, although there is nothing in the heart? Was their faith like the faith spoken about in Luke's gospel where those who believe for a time and then the seed of the world is suffocated before it can bear fruit or dried up and lost before it has taken root? Or is it the kind of faith that is looming, illumined by the majesty of the gospel which point to Christ as the, as the author of life and salvation? the kind of faith that rests in the heart. For faith is like an unquenchable thirst that takes its seat in the heart, cleanses it of disguise, lying, hypocrisy, and occupies the heart in such a way that it does not easily disappear. It seems for the Greeks that it was the latter. For they appear to be onto something in our gospel story. Because to understand well the strength and characteristics of true faith, we must seek a connection to God's word with which faith has such a relationship and correlation that it cannot be better appreciated from any other source. For John tells us in the beginning in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and God, and the Word was God. God's Word is the object and goal of faith. And if it turns away from that world, it is no longer faith, but an unsure credulity and wandering error. The same Word is the foundation on which faith is supported and upheld. If faith is withdrawn from the world, from the word, it immediately stumbles and falls. The Greeks were seeking an encounter with the word, and they, re and they received what they were seeking. For Jesus said to them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus takes the story in Luke about the sower and bears it out. For Jesus is the good sower, for the ones who, when they hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patient endurance. Faith, therefore, is a firm and certain knowledge of God of God's goodwill towards which, being founded on the promise freely given in Jesus Christ, is revealed to our understanding and sealed in our heart by the Holy Spirit. Every Sunday, in many of our Presbyterian congregations, we reaffirm our faith using all or part of one of our confessions, often the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, or a brief statement of faith. The first part of the Constitution of the Presbyterian Church USA is the Book of Confession, which contains 11 formal statements of faith structured as creeds, confessions, and catechisms. Elders throughout the denomination training for leadership study each of the confession, its, hor its historical origins, and its theological emphasis. Candidates for ministry must demonstrate knowledge and understanding of the confessions on ordination exams and before their presbyteries. Why do we use and have such statements of faith? Because as Reformed Christians, or as a part of the Reformed tradition, we are a confessional church. 
We have confessions because of the scriptural precedent of being confession. Presbyterians claim scripture as the primary rule of faith and life, and thus the confessional nature of scripture can be found there. The Hebrew scriptures tells of the covenant between the covenant people affirming in worship, the Shema. Hear, O Lord. Hear, O Israel. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I, that I am commanding you today in your heart. The New Testament records the earliest Christian creeds that Jesus is Lord and every tongue should confess to the glory of God the Father. We confess our faith because we are a community of believers. As Reformed Christian, faith is belief, trust, and obedience to God as revealed in Jesus Christ. It is the means of salvation. Paul expresses in Ephesians, by grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not the works, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. Therefore, our knowledge of God is called faith. It is in this faith we must seek and consider God and God's work which the scripture calls invisible things because these works represent us that represent that to us that the Lord which otherwise we cannot see by this faith faith alone with God we must acknowledge the son just as God offers us the son through the work through the word of the gospel so we embrace the Son through faith and acknowledge him as given to us. It is true that the word of the gospel calls all to participate in Christ. His only believers enjoy Christ. They receive him as he has been sent to them. They do not reject him when he is given to him, but follow him when he calls them. Paul says we must grasp what is the length, breadth, depth, and the height of the knowledge of Christ's love, which is above all knowledge. By this faith, as John Calvin says, along with the Father and the Son, we must acknowledge the Holy Spirit, for there is no doubt that faith is the light of the Holy Spirit through which our understandings are enlightened and our hearts are confirmed in a, in a sure persuasion which is assured that the truth of God is so certain that God can accomplish that which God has promised through God's holy word. And how has God accomplished this? By putting his seal on us and giving us his spirit in our hearts as a first installment. Paul tells us in Ephesians, in him you also, in him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is like a guarantee which confirms in our hearts the certainty of the divine truth and sealed by which our hearts are are sealed in the expectation of the day of the Lord. For it is the Spirit indeed who witnesses to our spirit that God is our Father and that similarly we are his children. So faith is a firm and solid confidence of the heart by means of which we rest surely in the mercy of God which is promised to us through the gospel. This is our promise. And this definition is not different than what the apostle says, in which he teaches that faith is the certainty of things to be hoped for and a demonstration of things not apparent. For he means a sure and secure possession of the things that God promises 
and an evidence of the things that are not apparent. That is to say, eternal life. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven came. I have glorified it, and I would glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, the voice has come for your sake. Faith does not promise either long years or great honors or abundant riches in the present. In the present life. And as, and as much as the Lord has wanted any of these things to be fixed on us, but is content with the certainty that although more than any few helps of this life may be lacking to us, God will never fail us. The principal assurance of faith rests in the expectation of the life to come, which God's words, which God word has put beyond any certainty for us. Whatever calamity and wretchedness that may come to those whom our Lord has once revealed, received into his love, it cannot hinder God's benevolence. This is why when we want to express the summary of all blessed, blessedness, we point to God's grace. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. As Presbyterians, we are a confessional church because we are an evangelical church. To our own contemporary experiences of God and Christ through the Holy Spirit at work in our lives, the confessions add continuity, expression of faith that reach back through the centuries to the earliest believers. The confessions offer not only continuity, but also the extent to which we have to define our faith. We who believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ have a mandate to share that good news for the sake of the world. The gospel of Matthew cites this mandate in Jesus' final words to his disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the, Holy, and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Finally, when it came to the part in the opera where the master had stopped writing because he died, Tuscanini stopped everything, turned around with eyes welling up with tears and said to the large audience, this is where the master ends, and he wept. But then after a few moments, he lifted up his head smiled broadly and said, and this is where his friends begin. Then he finished conducting the opera. Amen.